I think uh, this morning I'd kind of like to turn our attention to uh, some verses out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Luke, chapter 22, I'm going to begin with verse uh, 35. Luke 22, 35. And then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Um, if you were getting, to ready, getting ready to go into battle, if you were in the military and you knew you were about to face the enemy, what would you want to take with you? Uh, wouldn't you want the largest, most fearsome, effective weapons that you could possibly find? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and if the other side was sitting there with tanks and cannons and missiles, would you want to go up against them with a slingshot and a BB gun? Not, probably not. Um, but you see, this idea of strength being the most important thing, of numbers being the most important thing, of size being the important thing, when you're going into battle, God takes that idea and he turns it on its head. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The passage that we read in Luke, though, uh, it helps to remember what the, the context was that this conversation was happening in. Jesus and his disciples were gathering together after the Last Supper. Judas had already left the group to go and betray Jesus. The disciples had broken up in, into little groups and they were talking, of, having a discussion about who was to be the greatest in the coming kingdom. And it was pretty obvious from the things they were saying that they were missing the point of Jesus' teaching. And it was about then that one of the disciples came up to Jesus and he asked him if two swords were enough. And Jesus said, it is enough. Now, that, that phrase uh, stood out to me. Uh, it is enough. And I think it has at least a couple of different possible meanings. Um, it is enough. What, what does that really mean? I think you could say maybe they were talking about that the two swords were uh, sufficient for their purposes. Uh, think about the, the kind of men that the disciples were. A lot of those guys were fishermen. And, you know, they had a lot of tools that they used as they went about their business. And no doubt having a sword would have been one of the tools that they would have used. You know, they could cut away brush along the shores, they could get at the seaweed, they could, you know, slice up a fish if they had to. Uh, it would have been just like a, another tool that they had. Uh, just everyday life in the fishing business. Nobody thought anything about it. I don't know about the guys here, but I remember when I was in school, elementary school even, it was not unusual for the boys to carry a pocket knife with them all the time. Now, did we need one? No. But, you know, think how times have changed. Because today, carrying a pocket knife into a school would probably get you expelled from school, at the very least. Um, so those were not, in our day anyway, they were not considered deadly weapons. It was just something that, that little boys had. So it, it helps us too, I think, to um, picture or understand what kind of sword we're talking about. If you're talking about the kind of sword that a Roman soldier used, those things were deadly. I mean, they were in a class by themselves. They were called a, a gladius. I guess that's where they get the name gladiator. I, I, I'm not sure. But the gladius was the main weapon of war that the Roman soldiers had. And with that weapon, they conquered most of the known world. And picture in your mind what this gladius must have looked like. It was, it had a wide blade, it weighed seven or eight pounds, somewhere between 40, 44 inches long. It was a massive thing. And when they went into battle with one of these things, it, if they use it just to thrust forward into the enemy, um, if you were impaled on one of those things, there was no surviving it. They were meant to deliver a fatal wound. It was almost impossible to survive that. Um, even when Roman soldiers or leaders or whoever decided you know, they were going to take their own life, usually the way they did it was they fell on their sword because there was no way they were going to survive that. They meant business when that happened. Um, if they used those swords, you know, in a downward thrust like that, they were so massive and, and so heavy 
that they would cut through helmets and armor, through bones and what have you. It was a fearsome weapon. It was designed only for killing. Um, the point is that this kind of weapon is something that only the Roman legions would, would carry. It was not used by the everyday people like the uh, disciples. Um, they're the only ones that would have had legal ha access to one. And the disciples could not have walked around with one of these things because of the massive size. There was no hiding it. And it's not like a concealed carry thing because that thing, you know, was huge. So they were, those weapons were used as a weapon of war, a weapon of death. But the swords that the disciples were carrying were something else entirely. Um, they were a far cry from those deadly weapons that the Roman soldiers used. The disciples had a sword that was probably fairly small. It was about 14 to 18 inches, or maybe about one, one and a half pounds. But they were known for being just as sharp as a razor. Uh, perfect for slicing off an ear, which is what ended up happening uh, to one of the men that came to arrest Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so, picture the two different types of weapons that they had. And Jesus' disciples were no match militarily uh, against the Roman soldiers. The disciples were not going to beat the Romans in, in a hand-to-hand -hand battle. And so, uh, is, is that what Jesus was talking about? I don't think so. Jesus had something else in mind. But another way you could look at that verse is that when Jesus said it is enough, he may have meant something else entirely. Uh, Jesus had been teaching them for three years, and there was still a lot of things that they didn't understand. I wonder if those words of Jesus could have been a, a cry of exasperation, you know, frustration with his disciples. Probably the only way we could really ever understand completely what Jesus meant was if we could have been there and heard the tone of his voice. Did he sound exasperated? Was there sadness in his voice? Maybe even anger. Uh, maybe Jesus wanted to put an end to their arguing. Um, obviously they had misunderstood what he was trying to teach them. Uh, those that have kids, did you ever have one of those days when your kids were getting on your last nerve and you about reached that point and you said, enough! Um, it was the tone of voice that was used, that possibly that Jesus you know, was trying to express frustration with his disciples. He got tired of the arguing. Uh, so, there's two possibilities here on that verse, what that means. It could have been saying that, well, this sword is enough for our purposes. We're not going into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Or it could have been an exasperation exasperated uh, a cry or a frustrated cry from Jesus. And maybe it was a mixture of both of them. You probably heard the song, uh, Little as Much When God is in it. Well, that's so true. And that's basically the same as we find in Scripture. When Paul said, My strength is made perfect in weakness. Um, the day that we live in, is um, a day of excess, I guess. It seems like we believe that more is better, bigger is better. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this, uh, this watch, uh, it, I've had this for a long time. <laughs> um, a while back, I was in a store and I had a clerk made a comment to me. She, she saw the watch and she kind of 
hinted that maybe uh, I was due for an upgrade. <laughs> and this thing, this is over 40 years old. Wow. Um, but she seemed to think, well, uh, maybe it's a little outdated. Maybe I should get a, a smart watch or an Apple watch or whatever. Um, but you know, I got to thinking about that. What do you use a watch for? What is its purpose? In my mind, its purpose is to tell time. Amen. Um, and my watch fills that purpose just fine. Its real value to me is that it has a sentimental value because it was given to me on Father's Day in 1980. So it has a sentimental value to me. Mm -hmm. Are there other things that could tell time? Yeah, sure there is. But this is important to me, and it does what I need it to do. It always has. Uh, I don't need uh, a fancy watch. I don't need some electronic gadget that needs to be replaced every year or two. Mm -hmm. This one works just fine for me. And nothing wrong with the other things. They're kind of cool. And if the watch quits, well, maybe I'll, we'll look at some of those. But in the meantime, uh, it fulfills its purpose. But society tells us something different. It tells us that we need to make more money. We need to have more power. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a bigger house. Uh, I don't know fancier food, you know, and on and on and on. But that's not the case always, or at least that's seldom the case. Um, look at this passage in Matthew chapter 17. When the man brought uh, the son to Jesus, and he would frustrated because the disciples could not cure him. Uh, he said he has seizures, he's suffering, he falls into the fire or into water. He said, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't help me. So Jesus frustrated, and Jesus does get frustrated, mm -hmm. believe it or not. And he was frustrated with his disciples. He says, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and the, it fled from the boy. It came out from him, and he was healed from that moment on. And the disciples came to Jesus afterwards and said, Why, why couldn't we do that? Uh, he said, Because you have so little faith. If you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Amen. This mustard seed that Jesus was talking about grew in Palestine and it had these tiny, tiny seeds. But when it grew, it could get up to 15 feet tall. Birds could rest in its branches. You know, faith is kind of like that too. It can start out small, just a little seed of faith. Mm -hmm. But over time, if it's nurtured, it can grow, and it can grow, and it can become stronger. Another story in the New Testament is that when Jesus was feeding the 5,000, and it came time for them to go home, all of the people that had come to listen to him, and, they, and the disciples encouraged him that he send them home. And Jesus, uh, you know, they went to Jesus and they said, well, you know, there's not enough food here to feed all of these people. Let them go home and get something to eat. And Jesus said, you feed them. Well, you know, on the surface of things, that didn't look like just the best idea, mm -hmm. but they canvassed the crowd and they came across a little boy that had two fish and five loaves of barley bread. And that little bit was enough to feed that crowd with much 
much left over. <clears throat> With that many people who had gathered to hear Jesus, uh, disciples could have understandably just said, oh, yeah, we don't have food to feed these people. Five, five loaves of, of bread and a couple of fish were barely going to be lunch for the little boy. But, you see, it was not a lot. But the key thing I want to remember is that it was everything he had. And that's the same uh, as the story of the, the widow back that came, you know, they were watching the people file by in the temple and dropping their money into the offering at the temple. And the passage in Mark 12 that describes that says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny, mm. calling his disciples to him. Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all of the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty. She put in everything, all she had to live on. Two pennies or two coins, whatever they were in that day, the smallest denomination of coin that they had, was not a lot, but it was everything she had. That's what God required. He wasn't asking everybody to give large amounts, but to give what we have. Not necessarily just money, but to give of our time, of our talents, our efforts, our, our devotion. Uh, give what we have. Way back in the Old Testament, when Elijah came upon the widow and her son, and Elijah asked her to bring him some water and to go to her house and bake him a, a small cake of bread. Mm. And she said, sir, I, you know, I got a handful of flour and a little bit of oil and I was planning to go home and fix one last meal for me and my son and then die. And Elijah said, just do as I, I ask. And she had faith in him. Um, he said, first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She went away. She did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. The, for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. Wow. In keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. A handful of flour, a little oil, it wasn't a lot. But it was everything she had. What do we take away from these stories? They all focus on, on small things, nothing extravagant. Yeah, it is true that sometimes God does request big sacrifices from people, but he doesn't ask for something they don't have. These stories focus on small things. Yeah, you remember the story of Moses when he was being called by God to go back and to Egypt and lead the people of Israel out. He, he gave excuse after excuse after excuse as to why he couldn't do it. He says, they won't believe me if I go back and say I'm, I'm speaking for you. So God gave him instructions to take his staff and it turned into a snake and he threw it down which 
That part I understand real well. I would too. Um, and it's gone until they pick it up again. And when he touched it, it turned back into his staff. And he said, well, I, I don't know. I still don't think they're going to believe me. He says, well, put your hand inside your cloak. And he did that. And he pulled it out. And it was white with leprosy. Wow. And he said, put it back. Wow, which wow. Moses did. And when he pulled it back out, it was restored back to hell. It's a, so God said, if they didn't believe you in the first miracle, perhaps they will believe you in the second miracle. But, it says, and just in case, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Now Moses begins to cut to the chase and what was really on his mind. Um, he says, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. God says to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. That was the heart of the matter. Please send somebody else in short, he didn't want to do it. He didn't think he was qualified. Moses had a horrible inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was basically saying to God, my abilities are not enough. Uh -huh. The funny thing is that Moses was right in a sense, because in his own strength, he didn't have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. But it was God working through right. him. Right. Using his weaknesses that would get the job done. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> when God calls you, I think this is a good thing to remember. Uh, come as you are and bring what you have, not what you wish you had. My Lord. And God can use it in his service. Thank you, Lord. All of these things are, are small items. There, there's nothing extravagant. Faith, the sight of a mustard, the sight of a mustard seed. It's enough. Five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. It is enough. Two small cone, coins dropped into the offering. It is enough. Elijah and the widow with their little bit of flour and oil. It is enough. So what should we take away? from all of this. I recently read an article that was called 10 Things That Drive Me Crazy About Working for a Church. Now, that in itself is probably a whole sermon, but I want to <laughs> highlight one thing that he mentioned, one point out of all of those. <clears throat> the author said, we focus way too much on what we don't have. Oh, Isn't that God. the truth? Uh, Amen. We're not big enough. We don't have uh, professional musicians. We don't have a fancy building. We don't have this huge praise band. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on what we do not have and ignore what we do. I, through the years, I have been to all kinds of churches, big ones, little ones, and I prefer the atmosphere in a small church. I think a small church has strengths that are lacking in the big churches. I can go to any number of churches around and get lost in the crowd, and some people like to get lost in the crowd. But if you come into a small church, you quickly become part of a family. And you know each other. You know on, the trials Lord. and the temptations. Yes, Lord. Um, I think it's easier to minister to people in that kind of setting and environment. Amen. Um, the gospel account of feeding the 5,000, all they had to start with was five loaves and two fish. But in the end, that was more than enough. They had baskets after baskets left over. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, 
Celebrate the small things that we do have. Remember, God can take nothing and make it into something. Hallelujah. Amen. And small things can have big consequences. You know, there is a, a negative side to all of this as well. The, there's a strange little proverb in Ecclesiastes. It's, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Like I said, it's kind of strange. Uh, never really thought much about that verse before. But it does tell us something. It tells us that something very small can ruin something very large. We spend a lifetime uh, building a life of character, uh, integrity, but you know, one act, one foolish act can undo all of that. Uh, Solomon said here in, in that verse, a little act of foolishness can undo something you've taken a lifetime to build. And he compares the life of a person to the, a vial of costly perfume, and it gives off a beautiful fragrance. But all it takes is a little fly to fall into that vial of perfume to ruin the whole batch. Something beautiful right away is turned into something repugnant. If any time you consider doing something uh, that is foolish, you might think it's just a little thing, but don't do it. Because you can unravel everything you spent a lifetime trying to build. There are things that cannot be undone. And way back in um, 1997, there was two men from Switzerland that built this a balloon and that they were going to be the first people they thought to circle the earth in this high-tech solar-powered pressurized hot air balloon but not long after they had taken off they started noticing strong fumes from a kerosene leak and that leak forced this balloon down into the Mediterranean in the end it was a small fuel clamp costing a little over a dollar that brought down a balloon that had cost them one and a half million dollars. Wow. It was an accident, but that little thing, that small leak, had huge, huge consequences. Mm -hmm. Amen. A good reputation can be destroyed in a moment. Size is relative. You know, you talked about the size of mustard seed and so forth. There's other seeds that Jesus could have used as an example. Uh, poppy seeds are even smaller yet. Uh, and orchid seeds, orchid, seed, orchid seeds weigh one thirty-five millionth of an ounce. They're smaller than a grain of salt. But take those and on the other hand look at the seed of a palm tree. They can be about 12 inches long and weigh 40 pounds. The size is relative, but you know, see a couple, five loaves of bread and a couple of fish is not a lot when you compare it to a big banquet. But in Jesus' hands, it was enough. Amen. A couple of small coins was not a lot when compared to the money the temple probably collected that day. Mm -hmm. But. It was everything to this poor woman that yet out of her devotion and love for her God, she gave everything she had. Amen. Well, flour, some oil, were barely enough to give this widow and her son a last meal. But Elijah showed her what could be done when it was placed in God's hands. Mm -hmm. What about us personally? Um, we think we can't do great things, that we are just one person.
But we can do something. We can come to him what, with what we have, no matter how small it is. In the book, uh, The Fall of the Fortresses, and I want to close with this story, uh, he describes an event uh, during World War II, and the author was in a bombing run across Germany, and as they flew over Germany, they were barraged by flak from Nazi anti-aircraft guns, and that wasn't itself unusual, but on this particular occasion, the gas tanks were hit, and yet somehow they made it safely back to their home base. And he said later he, the pilot reflected on this, this whole event, I was wondering how could a 20, 20 millimeter shell pierce the fuel tank without touching off an explosion. Um, so, he went and talked to some other people on the base and trying to find an answer to how they had escaped, how they had gotten away with being hit and not destroyed. And at, as they looked over the plane, see, they discovered that not only was a single shell found in the fuel tank, there had been 11 shells that hit the fuel tank. And any one of them alone should have been enough to blow that huge airplane out of the sky. And so he tried to investigate more, find out just what the real story was, what had happened. And he went to the armorers, the people that loaded up the, the bombs and the ordnance and stuff, and he was talking to them about it, and he wanted to get one of those shells as a souvenir. And they asked him, why didn't this thing explode? And so they couldn't tell him at the time, but eventually the answer came out. These shells, when they were put together, they said were, they went to open up one of them, nothing in it, plain as a whistle, no explosive whatsoever. And all 11 of those shells, as it turned out, were completely empty, uh, clean as a whistle. But one little detail, let's say one of them was not exactly empty. In one of them, they found a little piece of rolled up paper inside. No explosive, just that piece of paper. And on it were written some words in the Czechoslovakian language. And so they scoured the base and asked if anyone there knew how to read this. And finally they found somebody. And they said that when they read this note, translated the note said, this is all we can do for you now. Somebody in the assembling of those shells, probably working as prisoners of war or for perhaps sympathizing with their cause, had not packed them with explosive. And so, after, despite being hit 11 times, they came home. They, I think they believed in miracles after that. Um, you see, whoever put together those shells, they couldn't go out and do big things in support of the cause. Mm -hmm. But they could do a little thing, like not packing those shells properly. Wow. We may not be able to do big, grandiose things, but we can do something. We can bring our little bit of flour, we can bring our two cents to contribute. We can donate our two fish and barley loaves. 
we could be like Moses and say, I, I'm not qualified, I can't do this, I, I'm not a good speaker, I, I stutter, or whatever Moses' malady was. But, see, that's not the point. The point is that all that God asks us is what we have. He doesn't want what we don't have or what we wish we had, what we'd like to have. Only the little bit that we do have. Amen. And he'll take that and in the words of that song, little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Stand if you would. Oh Lord, it's so easy to say sometimes that we, we wish we had this tremendous talent and we wish we had all of these resources at our disposal that we could donate in your service. We need not be embarrassed by what we have to bring to you. Jesus never looked at the size of things. He looked at the heart that was donating those things. May, may we take what we have and use it in your service and to your glory. And then we believe that you will be able to say to each of us, it is enough. So Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together. And Lord, for all that you have done for us and will do in these days ahead, we praise you. Thank In you. Jesus' name.